Hey, welcome back to the food forest. Today is going to be a video on starting seeds. What kind of things are we growing? And then I have a couple tips for things you should use for your uh, planting medium, things you should absolutely not use. And then uh, also we're trying some neat things out now because the food forest is getting more mature. So we actually want some more uh, shade tolerant plants in there. So we're going to start growing some of those and try to get some of these established in the areas where we've got uh, more overstory canopy, where the peaches are, uh, that kind of thing. So stick around, there'll be something for everyone in this video. Let's get going. Okay, so first some of the annuals that we're growing, just kind of typical things. So these are some uh, West Coast seed stuff, uh, spinach, radishes, broccoli, lettuce, beets. We've got some uh, fennel, some arugula, some tomatoes. I really like the black creme tomatoes. They're very good for soup. They have a real, almost like a smoky flavor that just does so well in soup. Uh, some more stuff, cucumbers, carrots. Uh, what do we got? Mustard. Uh, we always grow sugar snap peas. These things are like my absolute favorite. We're gonna do a little bit of corn. We've got some cauliflower as well. Then we have some ramsons, which is an allium. And then we've got all of our seed saved tomatoes and peppers. These are la like land race tomatoes. And um, it's really important that you try to save your own seeds when you're doing, especially stuff like tomatoes, whatever you, whatever you really, really love. Save the, the seeds from the biggest plants because what happens in industry is that the seeds that you buy at Walmart, they're like the third tier seeds. So when seed collectors actually go and actually harvest their seeds, they keep the biggest ones for themselves. They sell the next biggest ones to like wholesale bulk sales. Then the seeds that you find in your local gardening store, that's like the third tier down in seeds. But then they're also the plants, the specific plants that did the best for that year's growing conditions, which is on your land. So your soil, your sun, your rain, your soil chemistry, your insect load, all of those things. The things that do the best are the things that you're gonna be saving. Then whenever I see stuff like this, I always pick it up. I don't even remember where I grabbed these from, but these are just basically, I don't even know what's in this. What do we got in here? Um, asters, black-eyed Susan, borage, butterfly weed, corn poppy, columbine, forget-me-not. Uh, Lance leaf coreopsis, mint, partridge pea, lupins, uh, coneflower, so like some really good stuff in here for the bees. We also got this from West Coast Seed, which is like kind of a lawn solution cover crop that we're going to sow down in the Old Man Walking Trail. So we added a bunch of hazelnuts and cherries and asparagus uh, all down there, raspberries, um, currants. And what we're going to do now is fill in the, the ground cover layer. So we had it basically just mulched with uh, shredded leaves and a little bit of wood chips and now we're going to establish a growing uh, green mulch on top of that to be the base floor of the food forest and then bring in the pollinators uh, and all the insects that we, that we want in the ecosystem. We're also going to be sowing some buckwheat for soil building. Just This stuff is pretty cheap and it's a ton of biomass. There's a reason why farmers use this to build soil. So any kind of cover crop soil building things that you can get for fairly cheap is a really good idea to throw into your food forest. Then we got some more uh, lupin seeds that I saved up from, from last year. And then we're also gonna be starting some shade tolerant plants. So my favorite is gonna be Salal. I'm really excited to, to grow this, uh, Gotharian Shallon. And I might've just butchered that name, but uh, this is a, a small evergreen um, bush that is very, very uh, shade tolerant. So that's gonna be perfect for growing here. I might be pushing the zone a little bit on this one, but I'm really hoping I can get this established. And then we've also got some fairy bells. Uh, this is also, I think, drops of gold or something it's called. So this has a, an edible berry as well. It's not the best, uh, but mostly it's there to, we're gonna try to get this established because it's a native and it also uh, tolerates a lot of shade as well. So we're getting some bigger trees around. We wanna get some shade tolerant plants established in the herbaceous layer and ground cover. So that's what we're gonna go for this year. All right, here's our growing medium here. And this is basically the next level compost that I have a video on, which I'll link right here if you wanna see what's in that. And it is basically like biochar, horse manure, our actual finished garden compost, mixed with a whole bunch of stuff inoculated with mushrooms from the uh, from the garden, 
and then it's mixed roughly two thirds of my compost, um, which is about a half of soil. So it's kind of like a third compost, a third native soil, and then a third of this. So this is what you should not use. This we bought when we first started gardening because I didn't know any better and it is perlite, vermiculite and peat moss. Peat moss is one of the most ecologically damaging things that humans do in the gardening space. Peat harvesting begins by clearing vegetation from the area to be harvested and the bog is then drained by digging shallow ditches along the periphery. The dense layers of peat must be dried before it can be harvested and this is done by running harrows over the top layer to loosen the peat which then dries in the sun. Once it's dried, the top layer is vacuumed into large harvesters. The harvesting of peat is regulated by the Canadian government and is classified as mining because of the method of extraction. And the harvest of peat has been the subject of much controversy. It takes about 2,000 years to grow a peat bog. When humans come and then pull all the peat moss out, they basically break all the ties that are holding the carbon in and the peat bog just starts off-gassing methane. Methane is like 30 times worse than CO2 for a greenhouse gas, and it's just stuff that we don't need in the atmosphere. Plus, it's actually ecologically damaging to the ecosystems of the peat bogs. So peat moss is something that you should absolutely just cancel out of your repertoire for gardening, and if you have any gardener friends that use peat moss, definitely consider letting them know about just how incredibly damaging peat moss is for the environment and, and for our atmosphere. So we're actually going to use the rest of our bag because it's already been harvested and there's no point letting it go to waste. It's not actually damaging to use it, it's just damaging to harvest it. So um, we got it, we're going to use it and we're never going to buy it again. There's a lot of alternatives that you can use instead of peat. Uh, peat is basically there to kind of fluff the soil up. So if you use any kind of biochar, that will do it by itself. Biochar is a, has a ton of porosity in it. Biochar is very, very low density, and there's a lot of oxygen spaces in there. And another thing that you can use is shredded up coconut coir, uh, maybe like dried out uh, kelp and seaweed, that can kind of work as well. Anything that will get kind of fluffiness and porosity into your seed starting mix is a really good idea. having biochar in my seed starting mix because it actually holds a ton of water as well so it really replicates all the things that peat is doing in my mix and it does it very very good for the environment you know actually good for the environment instead of bad for the environment there's one more tip that I want to give a couple things that I've learned as I've done this for longer and longer and I haven't done it for that long so definitely check out the comment section below for people who've been doing this for 30 40 years there's gonna be some wonderful comments in this video as well but one thing I've been doing uh, more lately is being more patient on when I start. So for us, our last frost date is May 24th. When we pull back six weeks from that, you're looking at around the start of April, you know, six to eight weeks. So we start ours somewhere around April Fool's Day. That's when I start. In the past, I'd started earlier. And really all you do when you start things earlier is that you will actually just get you know larger legier plants that then might have a hard time transplanting. There's a real sweet spot. You don't want to start things too late where you're putting baby plants in the garden that are going to have a hard time surviving against you know full wind and full sun and that kind of thing. You do want to put established plants in so that they're already up above any kind of weed pressure that might develop if you don't check on your garden that often. But at the same time, you don't want to have root bound constricted plants. You don't want to have plants that are just unwieldy. And then when you transplant them, they break and crack. And then also your growing area, you're going to have a certain distance where the lights are. And if a plant is kind of just sprawling and taking over, then it really reduces how much you can grow. It'll start smothering other plants out. If you really want that early food, the best thing you can do instead of say starting seeds and plants earlier is actually just to move to more perennials something that we've been doing over the last five years. We've actually been moving, you know, away from annuals, except for the things that, you know, I mentioned here earlier in the video, uh, things that, you know, you can't get in a perennial option, like tomatoes are just incredible. So I'll always grow tomatoes. But if you really want that early food, when you're planting your gardens out, your first frost date, I'm already eating. So I'm already eating my sorrel. I'm already eating kale. 
that's like self-seeded and coming back up. I'm already eating uh, spinach that's self-seeded and coming back up. And another favorite is Good King Henry. It's a green that we can be eating right away. Asparagus is right early in the season as well. So, you know, if you really want veggies early, the best thing is to do is find perennial options that are gonna start popping up right as soon as the ground starts thawing. The second thing that I've started to do a lot more is delaying when I actually plant out. So when you plant out, the worst thing that can happen is you get a late snow or a late frost and it kind of wipes out all your hard work. So you've done all this work for six weeks, you babied your plants, and then because you're super eager to get things in the ground, you put them in early and they just get wiped out. Also, when plants are very young, they actually can get stunted if it gets too cold. And when a plant gets stunted very early in its lifespan, then it actually has a hard time recovering. So if you can actually delay your plants, even though you'll be a week behind, if it's compared to a plant that got stunted for a week, that stunted plant may actually never recover. And the one that was planted a week later will outproduce it double or triple. Also, if you rush your plants out a week early, you're not really gaining anything because yes, you'll get earlier food, but at the same time, a plant that lives for say three months, it's just gonna die one week earlier than the other plant, but they'll both live for three months and they'll both put out the same amount of fruit. So rushing plants out earlier isn't really getting you any further ahead. Now, if you have cold frames or a greenhouse, you can kind of start things earlier and you can extend your growing season. So that's a reason why you might wanna start things a little bit earlier. But if you're not gonna be doing all of these constant rotations and you're really just gonna be planting a garden and growing food and then harvesting the food, rushing out a week early is probably not the play. You wanna actually just wait until you know you're good and clear. You're putting the plants in good quality, a potting mix and then you're putting them in good quality soil in your garden and you'll get a ton of food more than you could ever eat. Rushing out early isn't going to do anything to help. And the last tip is that you really don't need a ton of fertility in your seed starting mix. I have a little bit of compost, it's about a third of my growing mix, but the other two thirds is really low fertility. You also want uh, flat fertility, if that makes any sense. So what you really don't want to do is sit there and spray fertilizers on seedlings. A seed will actually have everything that it needs to grow right in the seed. Now there is some research that says when a seed sprouts, it can actually kind of determine the fertility of the soil that it's in. And within the first week, the seed actually determines the number of fruit that it's going to set, how early it will fruit, and also how big it will grow before it starts to fruit. And this is because if a, if a seed grows in really dead medium, then it knows, you know, it might only have enough energy and nutrient to put out like a single tomato. And the plant is actually not really technically intelligent, but there's so much intelligence baked into the evolution and genetics of the plant that the plant will actually determine that this is not a good season and I'm just gonna try to grow as fast as possible, as quick as possible and put out like one fruit and then I'm gonna be at least spreading my genetics on to the next year. So what that means is if you grow your plants in just like peat and sand or you know a completely dead mix, then when the plant sprouts it might see that as a cue that this is gonna be a very bad year and you can't really catch up to that with fertilizer down the road. So what I always like to do is I always like to have a little bit of my own like mega charged uber compost in with my mix and that way when the seed grows it's got everything it needs but also it puts out the roots into soil that actually has decent fertility but not a spike of like water soluble liquid fertilizer fertility but a calm cool like base load smooth natural fertility. Humic acid, fulvic acid, tons of micronutrients bound in biochar and organic matter in the soil. And really what you want to be doing is replicating nature and that's what nature would do. A plant like a tomato is kind of like a mid-succession plant. It's a leafy green. It's not a pioneer plant. So if you're starting your tomatoes in pioneer soil, dead soil, then the tomato's not gonna grow really well. If you're starting your tomatoes in like forest heavy fungal based soil because you grabbed some from your forest and brought it in and use that as your seed starting mix, tomatoes probably won't grow that well. So you wanna to try to mimic that kind of mid scale ecosystem transition of like not a super fertile soil, some base natural soil with a little bit of compost, something that would exist kind of at the edge of a forest. You know, maybe you've got some animals that are like pooping and there's some manure in there. You want the manure to be well aged, but you, you kind of want to mimic what that seed would have started out 
for the last million years of its evolution. If you can mimic that, then the plants will do really well. So that's why I use my mix, which is like a third of my mega compost, a third of my native soil, and then a third of kind of like a fluffy dead mix. In the future, I'll probably go really biochar heavy with that side and get that like organic fluffiness from there. Now, if you want more tips on actually how to physically start the seeds, I have like a 45 minute detailed scientific guide on all the things you need to get seeds germinating. And it really focuses on that growing area, you know, lights, germination, water, temperature, all of that kind of stuff, humidity. So check that out. I'll link it actually at the end of this video as one of the suggested videos. If you want more detailed on that and the science behind why that stuff works, to help growing your garden for this year, check that out and I will see you on the next one. I am like itching for spring. I'm so excited it's here. It's gonna be a great year. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful, wonderful spring. See you next time.